Are you able to see it, Reagan? Is that? Yep. I think you just okay. need to hit your presenter view. There we go. Yep. All right, great. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to uh, Breakout Room 10 where we will um, get some career and technical education updates from Reagan Satterwhite, the Executive Advisor for the Office of Career and Technical Education at the Kentucky Department of Education, and Scott Ucellis, the Data Manager at the Office of Career and Technical Education with yeah. EE. I will be your host. I am Brandi Fagan. I am an Educational Recovery Leader with the Kentucky Department of Education. So we are looking forward to hearing these updates, and I will turn it over to our presenters. All right. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, again, yeah, th thank you all for having us. And yeah, great crowd over a lunch. We didn't we didn't know what the crowd would look like at 12 o'clock, but this is great. Um, really good crowd. So yeah, as Brandy said, uh, <clears throat> I'm Scott Ucella, data manager in OCTE and uh, Reagan, our uh, policy ex executive advisor. And we're going to walk you through some updates here. Feel um, free to first, ask us questions at any time. Yeah. Too. You can jump in if you need to on, on any particular slide. Absolutely. Please do. Please do uh, make it as interactive as possible. Um, we definitely wanted to lead with this. Um, February coming up is CTE month. So again, every February, the CTE community celebrates CTE month to raise awareness of the role that CTE has in readying learners for college and career success. CTE month is also a time to recognize and celebrate the achievements and accomplishment of our CTE partners at the local, state, and national levels. And as you can see, Reagan's much more plugged in on Twitter than I am, but our, our hashtags certainly share that out. And um, we're just really looking to celebrate. We're going to have some um, celebratory things at the Capitol and so on to really raise some awareness of, of what we're doing uh, as a state uh, in terms of CTE. I've also put our new Twitter handle in the chat box. OCTE now has a Twitter account that you can follow. It is at KY underscore CTE. Very good. Okay, um, one thing, this is kind of where my expertise lies and um, I'm very briefly gonna go over this. Uh, if post-secondary readiness is something you're interested in learning more about, um, uh, Shara Savage and myself actually have another uh, presentation at 1.20 this afternoon. So. Um, and we'll dive into this really deeply, but I just wanted to uh, hit on the surface level of uh, some items around post-secondary readiness. That that's always a, a popular topic that comes up around academic and career readiness. So um, on our side of the house, we're we're more um, oversee the career readiness uh, portion of that system. So. Uh, these indicators will probably look very familiar to you if you're if you're familiar with career readiness. Um, four of these five have existed previously. Uh, there is one uh, potential new indicator that will come on board this year, but um, the CTE into program assessment uh, was formerly known as COSA several years back. Um, this is an assessment that kids become eligible for as soon as they become concentrators, CTE concentrators, which is two or more credits in a pathway. So once kids have uh, passed two credits in a pathway, do, they do become eligible for what's called the end of program assessment for many of our career pathways uh, is one route to become career ready uh, for your kiddos. Uh, secondly, there's CTE dual credit. This is a dual credit that's a KDE approved dual credit for CTE. Um, a good rule of thumb on this is that um, the course code that needs to accompany this um, to count for CTE dual credit needs to be a valid CTE course code. And what we mean by that normally is that um, if you were to look in our CTE program of studies, you would find that particular course code in one of our pathways. So basically, it's a dual credit course that aligns nicely with one of the courses found um, in our career pathways document, um, would count for CTE dual credit and would count for career readiness. Um, third, this is always of interest, uh, industry certification. This is the only way in the post-secondary readiness accountability system to earn any sort of bonus on behalf of a student. So in, in the way that is done, um, certain industry certifications that we have are deemed high demand in our industry certification list because they're connected to uh, five of the high demand sectors in Kentucky. So um, we have an actual 
link to our industry certification list. I believe is that linked here, Reagan? It the, is. The actual, okay. So you'll see, you would see by the certifications that are high demand, there's an HD column for high demand. Um, and again, th that, that is the only way out of any of these options that a school could earn a quarter bonus point, basically, on behalf of, uh, of a student. Um, apprenticeship is the fourth one. Um, again, th this is nothing new. These first four, nothing is new. Th th this is all basically what it has been in the past, um, ways to benchmark. So the apprenticeship, th the way we track that is, uh, no pun intended, is called the TRAC Certificate, the Tech Ready Apprentices for Careers in Kentucky or TRAC program um, is an apprenticeship pathway that we have in CTE. And once kids benchmark in that, and th there's a whole process there beyond just passing an exam, basically you have to apply and get a credential, uh, the TRAC credential for the, on, on behalf of that student. And that's a portable credential it's an apprenticeship credential that, that is portable throughout the United States. It's through the U.S. Department of Labor. So uh, that's the apprenticeship way to benchmark. And then uh, the fifth way, and this is the new way, and I'll go much more detail into this in a further presentation later this afternoon. Um, there is going to be a way to benchmark in cooperative internship and what's called experience-based work. So basically, this is a work-based learning indicator where if, if a kid... Um, completes a certain number of hours, earns a certain grade in a work-based learning opportunity, specifically co-op and internship within a CTE pathway, they can uh, uh, become career ready in that way as well. This is also um, available to non-CTE students. Those that are not necessarily in CTE pathways can benchmark in what's called experience-based work. Again, I'm not going to go too deep into that right now. If that's of interest, um, again, later on this afternoon, there will be a very uh, deep dive on post-secondary readiness. There is a question in the chat mm -hmm. about sure. industry certification. Mm -hmm. um, sure. If a student takes an industry certification exam at a vocational school, is the student required to take the EOP assessment at his or her high school, or is it optional if he or she takes both? Uh, it, it would be optional it, it, at that point. Um, it, everything rolls back to the A1 enrollment. So even if they take it at the technical school, the Area Technology Center or Career Technology Center, the accountability will roll back to the high school. But if the question is in terms of like um, industry certification versus EOP, um, I don't want to get too deep into the Perkins legislation and things like that. But um, kids that are CTE concentrators should take one or the other before they graduate. Um, they're really required to take either an EOP or an industry certification. But if they already pass one, there's no need necessarily to take the other. Sure. And there's one other um, mm -hmm. question. Does sure. the CTE dual credit have to be state approved? For example, cosmetology no longer is supported by the dual credit scholarship. Will it count for post-secondary readiness? No, unfortunately not. Um, because it's, it's not found in our CTE program of studies document, statewide approved pathway. Unfortunately, uh, cosmetology is not on there. So uh, unfortunately, that, that would not count for CTE approvable CTE dual credit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, this is really exciting, and, and Reagan's probably better to speak to this than I am, but uh, the new work-based work learning manual uh, we've been working on this for a really long time. In fact, I think the last time um, we published a brand new manual, I believe Reagan was 2015. Mm -hmm. It's been, you know, seven, eight years that we've had the previous version out there. So we've been working very hard on a new work-based learning manual that walks you through everything A to Z on every single type of work-based learning, whether it be, like I mentioned, cooperative, internship, apprenticeship, or things like school-based enterprise how to job shadow, all of those things are walked through. So it's a, it's a really great document. Um, there's fillable PDF forms in there, uh, promotional resource pages, infographics for display, and again, a, a pretty extensive FAQ document in there. So pretty much anything you'd want to know about how to allow your kids to participate in work-based learning, uh, that's going to be a fantastic new resource. Let me just add, Scott, too, if you don't mind. Um, sure. We also have a dedicated work-based learning coordinator. Yes. Um, Tina Brogel has been with our office 
maybe 18 months, almost, almost two years, something like yeah. that. And so this has been really her baby to work on and, and put out there. All the forms yes. are fantastic. There's a form like roles and responsibilities of each person. There's a checklist of how to approach an employer if you're interested in them hiring a student for a work-based learning experience. So um, if you do have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to Tina about work-based learning. Um, and then there was a question in the chat that said, will there be a training or Zoom on the new work-based learning manual? And yes, there will be. Um, we plan to offer that, to record it, uh, make that available, and then also uh, we'll host sessions at our summer conference this summer around the new manual and all the resources that support it as well. Great questions. Great questions. Okay, and uh -huh. moving on, just uh, we did want to share some of the uh, links here um, to our different standards that we have in CTE. Uh, we get the question a lot, you know, what standards do we align to? Um, it, it's not as cut and dry as, um, say, your core subjects that very expressly uh, connect Kentucky academic standards for mathematics, things like that. But we do have pathway standards um, that align with our career pathways that um, th these uh, were previously called COSA standards that, that align to our uh, different career pathways, but, but they're specific to that pathway. So those are standards you would use as you're uh, developing the courses and the coursework in, in the career pathway that you're offering at your school. Um, we do have a formalized document, Kentucky Career Studies Standards. Uh, if you were to look at that, they do look more similar to what you'd expect from, uh, in, in, in Reagan, those are Kentucky Academic Standards, I believe, Kentucky Academic yes. Standards for Career Studies. So mm -hmm. um, th they'll look very similar when you look at those to what you'd expect to see mm -hmm. for like your Kentucky Academic Standards for math and social studies and science. Uh, they're very formalized standards um, th that can be used across the spectrum. Um, for CTE, not just for high school. Um, we do have an academic and employability standards that um, actually complement our pathway standards really well um, in that if a student takes an end of program assessment that's aligned to a, a particular pathway, uh, part of the blueprint of that exam does align to our academic and employability standards or, you know, quote unquote, soft skills that, that kids should have um, when they leave our doors. And then finally, um, we get this a lot, it, you know, that they have, schools have very fleshed out CTE programs at the high school level, and they're looking to kind of get their feet wet at the middle school level. Um, these middle school standards are out there. They're, they're great uh, to help you kind of get into some of those exploratory uh, topics and, and help um, expand career and technical education at the middle school level so that when kids get to high school, they have maybe a, a much better idea of things they would be interested um, in pursuing and pathways they are interested in, you know, at the high school level. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Reagan. Thank you, Scott. Um, can anybody tell me if the link to the PowerPoint that I sent in the chat box opened successfully? If not, I will try to send another one. Okay, perfect. Um, there are some great links in the PowerPoint, so I wanted you all to be able to have access to that so you can um, use any of the links that you may not use on a regular basis or you did not know about. Um, for some of you all, the link that I'm going to share now, it's also embedded in the PowerPoint where it says access here, but I wanted you to go ahead and have that link separately, is going to be something new to you. Um, if you are not aware yet or you have not been on our new CTE Basics site, it is fabulous. Um, if, if you've heard of or worked with Teresa Rogers, she was a wonderful asset to our office that did a lot of work with our career study standards, our academic and employability standards. And Teresa retired um, at the end of 2022. And so we miss her greatly, but she has left us with this wonderful site full and full of resources. Um, this site is an on-demand professional learning library. It's designed to bridge the knowledge gap between general education and career and technical education. 
These short targeted sessions provide a basic overview of CTE and the audiences for teachers, counselors, really anyone, even parents, as they engage students in career conversations, exploration and development of their individual learning plan. And so the first thing that this gives is just a graphic of our Kentucky Academic Standards for Career Studies, and it breaks it down into the different levels. As students are in elementary school, we really want students to just be aware of the careers that are out there. We know students in elementary school are what you normally hear of them learning about your nurses, your police officers, your firefighters, but we really want students even at that young age to be aware of all the different types of careers that are out there and possibly some of the each individual career clusters. In middle school is really when we want students to start engaged in career studies so that they start actually looking into what some of those careers actually do on a day to day basis. Now we're not telling the middle schooler you have to pick a pathway and you have to stick with it and you have to complete it and you're not allowed to change it. We just know that's not feasible and we know that's really not feasible for high school students to pick a career their freshman year of high school and stick with it and they're never going to change it they're never going to change their minds. Yes, they are they're going to change their minds several times, most of them anyway. And so the high school stage of career studies is really to immerse themselves in the experience of determining what's involved in a future career. Perhaps they're participating in it. We'd love for our students to be involved in work-based learning opportunities. And we know based on data and observation that students that participate in a work-based learning experience are more successful in their future careers. I know for me, I participated in a cooperative course in, in high school, and it let me know that I actually did not want to be an accountant, but I was really happy to find that out my senior year of high school instead of after I'd taken so many uh, college courses and, and paid the money for them. So it, it was a blessing that I was able to get that experience in high school. This, this site has other wonderful things. It has a tab for basics. If you wanna know what is dual credit, how do you get involved in dual credit? If you've got a teacher that's interested in offering dual credit, but maybe it's intimidating to them because they've never done it before. It's gonna give some resources around that. Um, elementary and middle school have their own tab. And what is really awesome, and I wish I'd put a separate screenshot of it in here, actually, just so you could see exactly how many. Teresa created a video library, and there is about 30 different PowerPoints in that video library that go over CTE topics. And she actually does voiceovers on the PowerPoint and has some videos on there that will walk you through just the basics of career and technical education. Um, so it is awesome. If you have not checked that out, please do and share it with your teachers, your counselors, and anyone else that, that might benefit from that. And we plan to keep adding to it as well. All right, Scott. All right, we just want to give you a quick update on legislative wise, as I'm our policy advisor, what we've done in the Office of Career and Technical Education and where we want to go, um, what our current legislative priorities and our future priorities are. Um, in the 2022 session, House Bill 1 appropriated a historic amount of money for career and technical education. Um, we are used to receiving about $12 million in our general pool for our locate our, our layback fund, local area vocation education local area vocational education centers. Um, but in 2022, for the biennium budget, we re-received re $70 million, so a $58 million increase. And so what that allowed us to do was to fund all career and technical education, regardless of governance or location. We were able to not only fund our state-operated centers, but any school where there's a CTE program at the secondary level for high school, we were able to give some state funding. So the growth in the number of schools that received funding was from 96 schools traditionally received it. So we went to 316 this biennium budget. And so that brings us to our continued legislative priority. And you can go ahead to the next, next slide, Scott. <clears throat> 
okay, we're used to this money. It's been able to do amazing things for our schools. We have testimonies that we share with legislators about the equipment that's able to be purchased and all the new and exciting things that schools are now being able to upgrade in their career and technical education classrooms. It's made a very positive impact. So our main priority going forward is to sustain that funding and sustain it at an adequate level to make sure there is enough funding for career and technical education, not just in each biennium budget, but for all future budgets that, that there is money appropriated for career and technical education. In addition to making sure that we have sustainable and adequate funding, we also want to make sure that we are funding all schools in an equitable manner and that we incentivize and we recognize schools that are doing a really good job at it. And so we, um, we also plan to codify a new funding formula. This funding formula will be the same regardless of area technology center or local center, local comprehensive high school. And if you'll go on to the next slide, Scott, I'll give an overview of kind of what we're thinking in regards to incentives. Using a framework um, that you may be familiar with, is the Association of Career and Technical Education's high quality CTE framework. So this framework identifies 12 elements that determine effectiveness of uh, any type of career and technical education program. In Kentucky, we have 13 CTE programs with 138 pathways. And in each one of those pathways, all 12 of these things support high quality instruction and a high quality program, a successful program. And so we know that many of these are actually Perkins requirements, things that schools must do in order to receive their federal funding. And then some of these go above and beyond. So we know things like standards aligned and integrated curriculum sequencing and articulation. And so for there, we're talk, we'll talk about the four core sequence and making sure that you have the right four core sequence in a pathway and that it's from the state approved program of studies. Student assessment opportunities, exactly as Scott just went over with our post-secondary readiness measures, making sure we're aligning industry certifications to pathways, end of program assessments, track certificates, and things like that. Um, to pathways, that's a requirement. And then of course, making sure we're, communi we're communicating with our business and community partners and that they are involved in the development of our pathways and what we offer at our schools to determine whether those pathways are gonna offer um, careers that students can move into, that whether those um, pathways lead into high demand, high wage, high skill careers. And then our CTSO indicator is also a requirement. Each pathway must have aligned the appropriate career and technical student organization. And so we know that that is gonna be part of the formula and that's gonna be something that determines whether schools receive funding or not. It's our hope that we match that with federal funding, but we also provide some additional incentives, some extra bonuses to schools that are, that are implementing the additional indicators of high quality CTE. So for students that, or for schools that um, are showing that they have ac ac access and equitable programs, that they are giving access to programs in an equitable manner. There we go, that's a better way of saying that. Um, making sure that they are making all of their programs available to every student, that there aren't some courses that um, maybe some can't take because they're enrolled in band making sure that each student has the opportunity to complete a pathway regardless of what else is in their schedule or what other obligation that they have. Making sure that they have prepared and effective program staff. Of course, we do many things in the Office of Career and Technical Education that supports each one of these indicators. We're, we're seeing more and more occupation-based teachers come into CTE programs and our um, new teacher institute is something that helps prepare um, those occupation-based teachers to then be a classroom teacher. And so if you want any more information about that, you can always access it on the Association for Career and Technical Education's website. It is a wonderful framework with lots of ideas how to quantify each of these indicators. There are self-evaluative 
tools on the website that you can take to look at your pathways in your school and determine whether you are meeting each of these indicators and how successful your programs are at your school. We are also going to focus a theme of our career and technical education summer program, our, our 2023 CTE summer program at the Galt House. The theme of the program is going to be high quality CTE. Each of our sessions this year are going to be focused on one or more of these indicators and our program of the actual conference is going to be organized on these indicators. So if you know that you need special help in one or more of these, you can make sure that you are attending the sessions that are geared towards those indicators. All right. I see we only have five minutes, so I will try to speed through the rest and give an opportunity for questions. On February 21st, we would be thrilled if as many people as possible could join us at the Capitol, the Kentucky State Capitol, to celebrate Career and Technical Education Month with the Career and Technical Education CTE Showcase. We have 32 schools from across the state that are going to be demonstrating their high quality programs. Um, I will also include a link to all the pathways that will be featured at the showcase, but they are really impressive and I'm so excited to be able to show our legislators and our business and industry partners, as well as educators across the state, all that Kentucky CTE has to offer. The event starts at 1.30. It's going to begin with a um, proclamation of CTE month by Governor Bashir, Bashir and then a um, remarks by um, Representative James Tipton, he is the House Education Chair, and remarks by Dr. Glass, um, the KDE Commissioner as well. So we are very excited, would love to see as many of you guys there as possible, and maybe some of your schools are even going to be featured, so congratulations. Uh, lastly, let's stay connected. On January 31st, our first Career and Technical Office of Career and Technical Education newsletter is going to be going out um, to all audiences in the CTE community. This is going to have all kinds of updates and good news stories and links and resources. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you stay tuned for that. If you already subscribe to all KDE newsletters, you will definitely be receiving it in your email inbox. But if not, make sure when you go to this PowerPoint that you click that link and fill out just a quick Google form. All you have to do is, is plug in your email address to make sure that you are subscribed. We also now have a Twitter for anybody that does Twitter, so you can stay connected on a daily basis to our office. Um, if you want to follow us, it is at KY underscore CTE. All righty, Scott, we can wrap up and see if there's any questions or comments. People are just finishing their lunch. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you both very much. That's a lot of great information and um, we're looking forward to the new work-based learning manual and, and a lot of the new, the new things that we have that are taking place in CTE. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Feel thank, free to reach out to thank us. You. Links to the new manual will be in the newsletter. That will be where they are published for the first time. Thank you all. Thank you all. I think our next session is in the main room. <laughs>